Isaiah had amazing capacity to see what others could not see. This prophecy probably happened at a time towards the end of the Babylonian captivity or perhaps they, the people had already started to come back into the land that was designated for them before, before they'd been taken into exile. But it was at the end of a prolonged period of real dysfunction in the life of the people of Israel. They were not glorious. They were not doing well. And indeed, for a long period after they came back into the land, after King Cyrus decreed that they could come back out of Babylon and, and resettle in Jerusalem and all this kind of stuff, the place was still pretty messy, apart from a few shining lights like Ezra and Nehemiah, the leadership there, which were quite remarkable. The kingdom didn't get restored to former glory and certainly not of the nature that Isaiah seemed to think about here. So we're going to think about what Isaiah's vision really means. Let's ask God to open our eyes. Lord, please help us understand this ancient prophecy that we might hear and see the things you wanted to show your people all those years ago and even today. In your precious name, amen. Isaiah believed that the people would be seen for who they truly were. I had a revelation a couple of years ago that uh, throughout my life, one of my survival strategies was to remain invisible. Wherever situation I was in, I was a people pleaser, and so I would do what I thought people expected of me so that I would just fade into the background. I wouldn't be noticed. This came to light through a series of things which I won't bore you with, but I wondered why it was that I wanted to be invisible. And then I reflected on some of my uh, family story and my father who escaped from Nazi Germany as a Jew, and that was a, a horrific story which I'd kind of picked up over my upbringing and as I learned about the Holocaust and things like that, I realised that there were people who wanted to murder me not because they disliked me, they didn't even know who I was, they'd never met me, but because I was Jewish. And I thought, that's pretty scary. That's terrifying. I'd better stay hidden. Now, all of this happened subconsciously. I didn't know it happened. And so it became my survival strategy not to be visible, not to be seen. In a way, my outward strategy reflected my inward belief I had agreed with the persecutor that I didn't have a right to exist and so I wanted to become invisible. And so that was a, a thing to become aware of for me that I had to start to pull apart and deconstruct. Here, Isaiah is saying the people of God will be seen for who they really are. Their glory, the glory that is innate to them, will become apparent to the whole world. They have a right to exist, and not only do they have a right, but they will shine in that existence. And this will happen somewhat naturally. Isaiah says, just like a bridegroom dresses up for his wedding, or the bride adorns herself with jewels. And we're going to have a, a wedding shortly, Peter and Priscilla, aren't we? Yeah, I think you're going to dress up. And um, we know that, you know, you go to a wedding, you see the bride, she looks beautiful. That's a natural thing to do. Just as the garden produces plants and the soil allows the, the things to sprout up from within it. It's a natural thing. We know that's what happens. So the glory of the people of God will be seen. It will come forth. It's a natural thing. We will expect it to happen. We don't hear much about it, actually, these days. And our news cycle isn't prone to focus on good news or, or positive things. Our new cycle uh, taps into that thing in our human nature where because we're so risk averse, we want to survive, we, we want to know all the things that might potentially threaten us. So the new cycle is always telling us the threats, all the things that could go wrong or have gone wrong or might go wrong and this kind of stuff. ABC put out a, um, an article yesterday, I think it was, or the day before, good news items that you might have missed while you were scared we were going to get blown to smithereens by the North Koreans or the Americans or whatever. <laughs> and there were some lovely things in there, you know. Muslim hackers unite to wipe ISIS off the internet. Did you know about that? Yeah. 
That's going on. That's pretty cool. Prison inmates give their food to hungry kids. That's nice, isn't it? You don't hear about this stuff. These are good things that are happening. There's a whole bunch of them. Coral gardening helping to restore the Great Barrier Reef. Sounds good. Woman finds her father after 45 years thanks to a late line program. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> These things go under the radar. But a time is coming when everyone will see the glory of the people of God. Now, Isaiah saying this in the ancient world would have been just as kind of hard to grapple with as it is today. Like today we have mass media. And so it's not a problem getting information out there. The problem is in the deluge of information, working out what to be aware of. And so we just get swamped with so much information. In Isaiah's day, it was the opposite uh, kind of issue. They just didn't have mass media. So how could everybody know anything? It just, there was no mechanism to let people know. And so in a funny kind of way, we're very similar for very different reasons. But Isaiah says, everyone will see the righteousness of the people of God. Not self-righteous superiority, not judgment and exclusion of others, but this righteousness that is right relating, true righteousness. Because people are hungry for good relationships. Everybody has a hunger for that. A righteousness that is enacted love. We're never blind to people loving us. We do experience that and it, it does something inside us. Our risk-averse nature, our survival stinks, instincts warn us against danger, but they also draw us towards those who are good to us, those who look after us, those who are kind to us, those who are self-giving in their love. Now the people themselves won't have to blow their own trumpet because God will lift them up. God will be the champion of the people. And this is a good thing because people that blow their own tr trumpet, they, they're a little bit off, aren't they? You know those people that are always telling you about how good they are and all the wonderful things that they've done? You start to think, yeah, something's not quite right there. We don't need to do that for ourselves. We don't need to talk ourselves up. Isaiah says, God will lift the people up. God will do this because God has an interest in the people being lifted up because God's glory is seen when the glory of the people is made known. There's a sense in which God is magnified when the goodness of the people is seen by everybody. The more people who live according to God's way, the more the demonstration of God's goodness is evident to everybody and the more God will lift them up in order to be seen. Because in a funny kind of way, and this sounds almost arrogant, but the people of God show the way for all people. And you might look across history and go, yeah, they haven't done that so well, and I'd be inclined to agree with you. But they're, the basic stuff we know to be true. I love old black and white films. There's a 1936 movie uh, in which Gary Cooper plays Mr. Deeds. Now, they did remake with um, Adam Sandler, which is also funny, but not a patch on Gary Cooper's 1936 black and white Mr. Deeds Goes to Town. And uh, in it, Mr. Deeds is a very simple country guy, plays a tuba, and he inherits more money than you can imagine. And he's taken to the big city to receive this inheritance and put in a great big house and he lives in one room of it and has fun making echoes. It's a great film, you've got to see it. But um, in the end he decides he doesn't need all this money. Like, what's he going to do with it? And it's at the time of the depression and there's a lot of people out of work and he decides he's going to buy some fields somewhere and divide them up and give them to people who are unemployed so they can just make a living. And so the lawyers who are managing the money think, uh-oh, we're going to lose this big investment we've been creaming off. Uh, let's declare him insane. Because what sane person would have that much money and give it away? Okay, that's the world's thinking. In the final court scene where they're adjudicating whether Deeds is actually insane or not, um, there's a crowd of onlookers who are desperately interested in this case. 
because he's doing something that is profoundly good. He has more money than he needs and he's giving it to people who need it. And everybody who doesn't have a vested interest knows that is good. We know when something is good. We know when something is just. We know when something is sound and a healthy way for a community to be. We do know that stuff. And so when the people of God live that way, other people recognise it. It becomes something that is genuinely glorious and others will go, yes, and they'll want to go that way as well. In fact, it's so glorious that the most glorious people will look across and go, oh, that's more glorious than us. Isaiah says that kings and all the emperors of the world will notice this incredible glory. You see, there is a glory in, in being royalty, and, and we know about that, and they have all the pomp and ceremony and all that kind of thing. But part of that glory is its exclusivity. Not everybody can be the Queen of England or the King of England. You've got to be in a certain family, certain German family, as it turns out. But um, it's a very exclusive glory, isn't it? It's not one that is shared with anybody else. It's a very particular group of people in a royal family or an empire or that's this kind of thing. But the glory of the people of God is one that every single person can participate in if they choose to. It's a stunning reversal of the world's way of valuing because in the world we value things when they're exclusive. You know, the high price, whatever it is, becomes really valuable because only a few people can have it. But in God's kingdom... The really glorious stuff is the stuff that everybody can equally participate in and have access to. And it might feel that that's not particularly glorious, but when you know what that is, you realise it's an incredible thing. It's so incredible that God's going to give the people a new name. Now, think about this for a moment. It's not just a different name. It's a new name. It's a name nobody has heard before. It's not a name you, like you go from being David to John or this kind of thing. No, this is an entirely new name to describe an entirely new category, a whole new quality of being that existing names do not cover. It's like when you know, the scientific world discovers a species that is significantly different from all other species that they've discovered before and they have to give it a new name because you can't describe it with any of the existing names. God is going to give the people, us, a new name because of the way we are in the world is so different to anything that has gone before. This is beyond what we have known. This is a whole new category and we will be God's crowning jewel what higher honour or category could there be the royal diadem signifies who royalty is there's a sense in which in one sense the crown is the permanent feature in a royal family isn't it interesting when you think about kings and queens they pass you'll have this queen and that king and but the crown is the permanent part. In, in one kind of way, the crown wears the king or the crown wears the, the queen because the crown exists and stays. You know, queen Elizabeth, she's a great queen or whatever you think of her, but she won't be queen forever because she will die. But the crown, it pre-existed her and it will exist after her and the crown makes the king or the queen and in a funny kind of way Isaiah is saying we are the crown we are the thing that shows forth the true quality and nature of our God because of the way that we live together with each other in the world the way we impact the world is that not incredible that's an extraordinary responsibility and privilege that we have in the way we conduct ourselves with one another and in the world. Now, 
again, we might reflect on the way the people of God have been the people of God down through the ages and say, well, it's been a little bit dodgy here and there. And you'd have to say that's true. But the call is always there to rise and be all that God's nature calls us to be. And what, what is that? That's following Jesus. That is Jesus' nature lived large in his body, who we are in the world. We don't know yet all that that will mean for us. We know today's tasks. God has good things in store for us and God will lead us in the direction of deeper and deeper riches. Not necessarily financial wealth, but deeper and deeper life riches that may well involve financial wealth, who knows? But God will lift us up. Not so that we can be a self-righteous blight on the social landscape of the world, excluding others and saying we're it on a stick, but the righteousness that is good relationships, that restores people and loves people, that is an example that any can choose to follow and those who value that which is good will long to follow, to follow in the way of life that is a blessing to all people which is the way of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Isaiah and his capacity to see something that we most often cannot see, that your people are glorious as they become more like you. As we follow in the way of Christ, there is a glory there that will transform the world. And we thank you that you call us into it, that we might show forth your glory to all, that all might sing your praises and respond to you in your precious name. Amen.